Hello everyone, BaselCon 2024, very excited to be here talking to you about Rules Lint. This is a project that I actually started two years ago. I remember the cocktail table I was sitting at in New York uh, at BaselCon discussing how I thought this could be done. And uh, last year got started and this year we've, uh, it, it's done enough to give this talk. So very excited. My name is Alex, uh, as, as for the purposes of this talk, I'm introducing myself as a recalcitrant basil enthusiast. I just can't seem to stop. Um, I worked on a team at Google called Tricorder, which was, uh, which a lot of this is modeled after. This is how static analysis is built at Google. And this is part of why there's no lint command in Bazel, because at Google, uh, Tricorder was the answer for this. And so, yep, I wrote rules lint, uh, along with a bunch of other contributors. Of course, thank you very much to everyone else who has put commits on here. There has been a lot of contribution. Um, so, part of the reason to give the talk is that we are now at 1.0. This is a stable Semver guarantee. You can start using this now. It is time to use it. Here it is on the Bazel Central Registry. Um, and it's, of course, open source, Apache 2. Everything I'm going to talk about in this talk is, is pure open source. Okay, so what is linting? Sometimes there's a confusion. Does linting include formatting? I'm going to present these as two completely different topics. In fact, these are sort of two different rule sets that are distributed and packaged together. So this is really sort of two talks. So let's do the first talk. Okay, so the first talk is about formatting. These are the languages that Rules Lint supports right now and the tools that are used for those languages. So quite a few of them. And the goal here is do all languages at once. I don't want to have any discussions that are language specific, right? Because uh, I think this is a problem that can be easily abstracted across them all. And let's start off with like, what is the goal of formatting? You know, why, why do engineers care? Well, the main goal is let's not talk about white space in code reviews, please, ever again. Um, and I think the observation is that yes, code is kind of art, but please not ASCII art, okay? It doesn't matter which, how many columns wide it is. You can argue tabs and spaces, like there's some funny XKCDs about it. It's not actually funny when we spend our like valuable time working on that stuff. Okay, so hopefully you agree with that. We have a bunch of properties about formatting that inform the way I think the developer experience should work in this rule set. The first is that you can only have one formatter per language. Clearly, if you had more than one, they would disagree. You wouldn't be able to pick. Uh, the behavior of the program should never change. We trust that the formatter doesn't break anything, okay? And this, depending on the language, of course, it has to be careful. Um, the developer doesn't have any alternatives. It's not like they can pick to do something else. And they also have to apply the changes. They can't say, no, I'm gonna skip this file. I like the way it's formatted already. Uh, it should operate on a single file at a time, which is important. Uh, and only the changed files, therefore, need to be formatted. We don't need to look at anything you didn't change. Um, and it's, therefore, it's fast. Even if uh, formatters are generally fast, but the fact that they only need to run on a single file makes it a fast workflow. So we can just do this in pre-commit. So how do we marry those principles with Bazel? Well, uh, we want to format all languages with a universal developer experience. We want to have one formatter that understands all languages. We want to use it with Bazel Run. Uh, why is that? Well, the formatters, it's great that Bazel downloads all of those tools for us, but we don't want to have to create build files that say, here's how to format the files in this package. A lot of code we want to format doesn't even go into the build file, like Markdown, for example. You probably don't want to have to create Markdown libraries in order to do formatting. And we want the developer to not have to interact with this at all. Ideally, the way you set up formatting for your team, they don't need to know that this is happening, which means something like git commit is the right place to do this. Uh, and so, and we don't need incrementality there, right? Um, so this, this is why it's not a Bazel build kind of a problem. And finally, the editor should still work. That's easy because users can just install the editor extension they already have, and all of the configuration files should be shared between what rules lint does and what the editor would do. Uh, you know, obviously modulo potentially some skew if they've installed one version of the tool in their editor and that's not the one Bazel uses. Okay, so uh, first I'll step through how formatting is implemented and then how you can use it. Um, okay, so there's a couple of inc incredibly awesome open source projects. At first I had started building these in Rules Lint and then realized that other folks were, were making foundational layers. Thanks to Bizelmod, it's pretty easy to take dependencies from your Bazel rules now. So. Uh, the first one is rules multi-tool. Uh, this is from Mark and the team at Theorem. This is a great way to fetch tools down to Bazel running them and very uh, ergonomic. So the way it works is that there's a program called multi-tool that manages a lock file, very similar to how you would interact with package managers. For the most part, we're downloading releases from GitHub, uh, although it can do more than that. Then it has a repository rule that you invoke that says use the lock file, fetch all the tools, and then they, it, it creates tool chains around each one, so we're only gonna have to fetch the tool for the one platform we need. So it's basically the shape you want. Um, 
here's what that lock file looks like. So it's JSON and you know, it's, it looks very much like an HTTP underscore archive call that you would have had in your workspace file and this, this, this lock file in rules lint, you'll see there's a couple of them uh, providing a bunch of tools. So here's gofumpt, for example. Okay, so now we've got the tools, Bazel knows how to fetch them, so how are we going to run them? Well, like I said, we wanna have one program that formats all languages. I had started writing this thing. It turns out um, there was an earlier incantation of this. I forget where it came from. Keith is the maintainer of the, the currently active fork, so I will give thanks to Keith in this talk. Um, and so rules multi-run is just a way to assemble multiple binaries, make them all Bazel runnable together, and it can run them in parallel, which is kind of what we want for formatters. Okay, the final ingredient uh, in the implementation here is a little shim. And the shim we wrote in bash because, uh, you know, I like bash. Um, and its job is to figure out which file should I format. And the way it knows that is it looks at the file extensions and it just maps file extensions to what, what the formatter is for that language, okay? Uh, and based on the number of arguments, there's sort of two modes. So I'm just gonna show some short code snippets here. So if there are no arguments passed, that means format everything, but not literally everything. We wanna see which files you care about. So uh, it uses git ls files with a little bit of care to not accidentally pick up files that you've just deleted. So basically everything that's not git ignored is what we wanna format. If you pass arguments to it, which is more typical, then its job is to loop over the patterns that you gave it, and then it runs find on line 13 here. That's the key that says, uh, given the, I, I'm looking for the ones with the file extension that the current tool I'm about to invoke is the formatter for that kind of code, for that language, okay? And then here's that final bit. Really, this is just a vendored copy from GitHub. The GitHub Linguist project is how GitHub does its syntax highlighting based on file extensions, and so we pick exactly the same ones. So not, not inventing anything new for how to know which language a given file is written in. That is then all packaged up together neatly and tidy for you called format underscore multi-run. This is the rule that you would interact with. This is a Bazel runnable rule and it just has the, the task of invoking that shim and then uh, configuring it with all the different formatters that it knows how to run. Um, so there's a few ways to use this. Uh, I'm, I'm opinionated, um, <laughs> so I, I think pre-commit is the way to do this, but uh, there are multiple ways that you can choose to wire this up in your repo. So first of all, you can run it on all files like I showed with no arguments passed to it. That is pretty useful if you want to just format your repo, one-time thing. That, you know, usually that's how you get started when you introduce formatting to your repo. That can disrupt developers who are working in some other branch. If they're naive and they try to do a merge, then they get a whole bunch of crap. But of course, they can just format their branch. So please give instructions to developers if you're working in the repo. I've just done this operation, run the same operation on your branch, and you'll be fine. And then once you've merged that thing, uh, hopefully many of you are aware of the .git blame ignore revs file, which is your magic get out of jail card to not appear in the blame layer as the person who just wrote all of this code that you formatted, right? And you don't want to, I mean, it's just, it just pollutes everybody trying to step back through git history. So please use that to keep things tidy after you run an operation like formatting on the repo. Okay, secondly, you can run it on specific files. So format this one line, you could hook this up in your editor if you wanted to have your editor extension call out to do Bazel format. Um, the third way, there is a format underscore test, uh, which was requested, and it's an open source rule set we can all play. I think this is kind of difficult to use because you have to choose between two bad options. Um, one of them is that it could be not hermetic. It could just be a test action, but it just discovers whatever files are in your Bazel workspace. Um, this isn't the first rule set to have that behavior, which is part of why I admitted it. I think Bill Dozer does the same thing. Um, or your other option is you can make it hermetic, but then you have to list all of your sources um, that you want to format. Uh, and, you know, and I, like I said earlier, Markdown, for example, I don't think it's a great use case for that. So for, in all the rule sets I work on and all the places that I'm using this tool, we just use pre-commit, which is precommit.com. It's not a Bazel thing. It's pretty good. Um, it is, you know, you, you, you ask your developers to install it. Um, and I think, by the way, you don't want to automatically have Git hooks show up in people's projects. This is a pretty bad uh, user experience, and you want developers to opt in. So I recommend if you set up a, a, a CI check that formatting has taken place, just whenever the CI check fails, say, hey, maybe you want to install pre-commit, and you'll never see this happen again. So you want your developers to know that they need to do a single setup step to install it. Okay, and then here's what it looks like to use. There's that format multi-run rule that I mentioned. It takes a bunch of attributes. The attribute names are languages, and the values are the tool that is the formatter for that language. And you can see some of these come from, you know, labels in this project because they are tools that Bazel needs to, you know, there's a wrapper, so like prettier is a JS underscore binary target, for example. Um, but pretty small, you can see some examples in rules lint. 
Uh, and then here's what it looks like to wire that up in pre-commit. It's pretty short. It's just uh, you types text on line eight means just run this on all the text files. And then, of course, line six says, here, I, I wrote aspect run using the aspect CLI. That would say basil run if you're just using vanilla basil. OK. Finally, uh, here is what it looks like for the developer. So I'm making a git commit. Is it formatted? Question mark. Of course it's not. So, you know, this dot, dot, dot uh, was running Bazel behind the scenes. We see here it formatted Python, Starlark, Java, Go, like every language in your repo. Uh, and now, of course, uh, it, it, um, it blocked my commit because it made changes. And so now my job is to, like, run the commit again and say dash A. This is just how Git works, right? And now everything is formatted. So that's, that's how developers interact with formatting. Problem solved. Let's never talk about white space, OK? Great. Second talk is linting. OK, so linting, very different. Um, fewer languages, because it's a little bit harder to wire up. These are the languages that are in there as of the 1.0 release, and the linter tools that are run for each language. Um, what's our goal? Let's, let's take the same, the same steps. Uh, the goal here is to shift left, essentially, on finding problems. So you want to you introduce a problem in your code. Static analysis generally is a practice of having the computer tell you what mistakes you've just made before you have to go do the expensive work of debugging inside of a test or in production. Um, however, there's an important secondary goal, which is that most of the time, shifting left sounds nice, but bugs are still getting through all the time. How many of those bugs that got through could have been caught by a static analyzer if you just went and looked and see if there is one, or in a lot of cases, write some simple logic that's just like, hey, this is a pattern that should not be allowed in our repo. It causes problems. Um, and this is a lot of what that tricorder system does for you at Google. It made it very easy to incentivize everybody in the repo, hey, contribute your checks so that we don't run into the same things over and over. And the main thing that's required for that to be successful is that it has to be really easy to, to add a new linter. If you make it difficult to add a linter, if somebody has to go through and fix every occurrence or suppress everything, they're just not incentivized enough to do that because that's not part of their job. Um, and so that's a lot of the motivation for what I think is the right way to hold it. OK. So we want to add a bunch of linters. Um, in contrast to formatting, linting is an incredibly different uh, developer experience that we want to have, right? We, we can have multiple linters per language. That's fine. They, can all, they, can, they, they just pr propose different fixes. Um, the, the linter may not have ex exactly one thing that you do, it could, uh, but it also it can change the behavior of the program. So you may have to test it. So you don't want to just automatically run the, the linter suggestions and, and never look at what it did. Um, the linter could produce multiple uh, proposed fixes that the, the developer selects from. So the developer does have choices, or you may just have to fix it manually if the tool doesn't propose a fix. You can suppress violations, so you have lots of freedom to just say, nope, not going to do that. That's, you know, you consider it a false positive, whether it really is or not is hard to say. Um, it can use the dependency graph, so it's not single file at a time, which means we do want Bazel involved to give us the dependency graph. Linters need to run as actions over the build graph. Um, and of course, part of the reason that you can't run it on a single file at a time is that lint violations in file A could be introduced by changes to file B. And so it is, uh, it is a, a graph-shaped problem. And so they can be slow. So we're not going to put this inside a pre-commit. So we need a whole different way to run it. OK. So how do we get those desired uh, developer experience within Bazel? Well, same as formatting the first bullet, we just want all languages at once. I don't want to spend time on, a, on any particular language. So that was part of the design for rules lint. Um, we don't want to change build files. I don't want developers to have to do that manually. We don't want to write a gazelle extension to add linting to build files. We don't want to have to wrap everything with a macro that turns our blah library target into a pair of linting and blah library, because all of those things are unergonomic. And also, the raw facts were already in the build file that said I have some sort of a library. So it shouldn't be necessary. We'll see in a second why. Um, we also don't want to have to try to change all of the rule sets out there. Right? I said I want to make this easy to add new ones. If I have to go convince authors of a bunch of different rules to change their stuff, it's just never going to roll out to enough languages to make it worth it. Um, we want to run everything with regular actions. We want all of the usual Bazel uh, properties of remote caching, remote execution, um, being able to de debug the build. So we, we want to participate in those things by just running actions. Our actions, of course, have inputs and outputs. The outputs. I'm going to model here as reports, which is what the linter found, patches, which is the suggested fixes, if any, and the exit code, because we, and I'll show why in a minute, to uh, basically support lots of different ways of using this, because, again, my opinion's not shared by everybody, sadly. Um, and, and of course, we need to make this minimal layering. Like, I, I don't have time, you don't have time. Nobody wants to, like, change the way linters run. So if the linter tool ran outside of Bazel, it should run under Bazel with just a tiny shim that says, basically, run underscore shell, right? Like, just wire it up as an action. So 
I'll step through the implementation here. Of course, the implementation uses aspects. No coincidence, we called our company that. Um, the blue nodes here, you can think of as the existing star underscore library rules that you already wrote and put in your build files, or hopefully you're using Gazelle to do that for you. And then this diagram is, of course, um, borrowed uh, with, with much gratitude directly from the Bazel documentation. The yellow boxes here is lint each of those things, and this is exactly what aspects were designed for in Bazel, so that's what we're gonna use. We just need to visit the library graph. Um, I'll note that I'm papering over some complexities here. You see that the, the, the edges are named, and we're kind of assuming that we're walking the depths. Uh, if you have uh, obscure dependency edges named other things, then it's harder to get an aspect to visit everything. Um, okay. So I'll step through a little bit of example code, not expecting you to read all of this. I'm doing style lint as the example because it's CSS and it sounds simple. Uh, and it's you know, not, not a language any of us is super passionate about, probably. Um, so, uh, so first of all, uh, the declaration here on line one is a factory function that returns an aspect, which sounds like rocket science, why would you do that? It's simply because Bazel's aspect implementation doesn't allow the attributes to take labels. They can only be strings unless they start with an underscore, right? So all the, all the attributes here are underscore something, which is a label, and then the thing you passed me, this is basically converting strings to labels. Whatever, it's fine, uh, it's not gonna cause a problem. Uh, so then that thing pointed to an implementation, right, for the aspect, so the implementation is, follows this kind of pattern. So line two, figure out which, which files it is we want to run on, that's basically, um, you know, there's a, a little bit of logic in there. Uh, we check whether the fix flag is turned on. If we're trying to do fixes, we want to produce patch files, and if it's not, then we don't. So we just have to figure out what are the output files we need. Those functions just come from a helper that all of these lint implementations share. Um, then there may be some command line arguments that we need to pass to the linting tool. So for example, um, there's a, you know, a color uh, attribute inside of this lint options info, basically a command line flag that you can pass saying whether you want to have color turned on or not. By default, of course, you want it to be based on whether the, ter the, the user is in an interactive terminal where colors are likely to render correctly. Um, so anyway, whatever arguments get passed to the linter look like that. Uh, and then we just decide, and then we need to like spawn an action. Okay, so like line 15 spawns a style lint action. That's just a little wrapper for, you know, basically calling into act uh, ctx.actions. In this case, we do run shell. Um, just to quickly talk through this code, of course, you know, typical, we, we declare the outputs on line two. We figure out what the arguments are to the program. Then we check the exit code, and there's a reason we're putting the exit code in a file, which I'll still get to. So in one case, we want to capture the exit code, essentially. In the other case, we let Bazel observe the exit code of whatever it just ran as an action. And then run shell just wraps it up. Um, and so that is the end of how you would implement style lint action. And I think I literally implemented this in about two hours after there was somebody at the conference who said, hey, we need this for our repo. And I was like, well, these are fun, because they're kind of easy. Not that much of a code to write, just a minimal layering. Okay. So, the part where I'm opinionated, but you have different opinions. This is fine. Um, your opinion might be that you want lints to show up in your repo as broken builds. You may not have these in your repo. Um, you know, basically an er a, a very hard error kind of uh, use use user story, user experience. So, that's kind of similar to a compiler failure. So, if you're running a linter that's sort of a type checker and you want to feel like you can't compile the code so you shouldn't be allowed to run it, then you, would, you can hook it up that way. So, there's just a command line flag that basically goes back to that spot I mentioned where we tell, tell Bazel whether to observe the exit code or not. If Bazel observes the exit code of the action, then it will just be a broken build. Okay, second is that we can have lints be reported as a failing test target. This is pretty popular, especially because this was sort of the only way to do it if you want to, if, if you're gonna, if the only thing you want to do is, is set this up in Bazel once and forget about it. If you're not gonna have, um, and I'll talk about the alternatives, of course. Uh, so to make it a failing test, um, this makes it hard to add new linters, but it's pretty simple in rules lint to do this. There's actually a lint underscore test, test rule, and its job is just assert that the exit code file you got contained the string zero. And if it did, then the thing succeeded, and so the test passes. So it's like a very tiny shim. Um, the third option, which uh, is to, you can use the lint command, which is part of aspect CLI. This isn't a product talk, so let's talk mostly about lint.sh. We basically need a very small way to kick off a Bazel build command, but I'll show it in a second. The syntax is kind of long, so you're probably gonna wanna wrap that for your developers. Um, lint.sh is short enough, you can just copy it into your repo and, and you'll be up and running. And then, of course, uh, this Marvin character, you know, come by our booth. We have a way to hook these up in code review. That's in practice uh, the way it works at Google. So, Let's look at how you would use this thing. I've run through the implementation. So um, 
let's say we have rough and shell check. Rough is for Python, of course. Clang tidy for C++. So we recommend having a linters.bzl file. You can name it whatever you want. You're going to call that factory function I mentioned earlier that creates aspects. So now I've created an aspect called rough and an aspect called shell check and an aspect called clang tidy. And now I want to call those aspects, and this is where the, develop, the ergonomics in Bazel is not great, uh, and so we need a little wrapper script. And it's basically two sections, so I've got these big arrows to point to them. Um, the first is that we need to do a Bazel build, which is all we need to generate these reports and exit code files, right? Um, we need to list the aspects we want, which is line five, so it's just dash dash aspects, and of course you may have more than one, I've just put shell check for simplicity. Uh, we turned off validation actions because you probably don't want to do those at the same time that you're linting. Uh, there's a JSON file where we're capturing the build event so that we can find out where those files got written. Then we turn on some output groups. This is how we select that we want the aspect to, to be executed. Under Bazel, if you don't request any outputs from the aspect, then it will just skip that action because nothing was requested. Uh, and then, of course, if we're using build without the bytes, as I'm sure most of us are since it's the default now, you'll want to say which outputs you want to download to your disk because we do want to have these reports locally, so there's a little regex to grab them. Um, okay, so then in the middle there on line 14, we just run a JQ query, which is just simply give me the, the output files that you just found, and then we loop over them the rest of the script. It's very simple. It's just find the report file and, and, and write it to the user. Okay. Hopefully everybody has now memorized this or written it down or whatever you need. <laughs> Just kidding. This is in the this is in rules lint. Uh, all the documentation should make it pretty easy for you to find and, and copy over the script. Of course, you might modify it for the developer experience that you want for engineers in your repo. Okay, so I'll show what this looks like. Here I'm typing Bazel lint with the aspect CLI. It would look the same if you did lint.sh. So it ran. It's got some suggested fixes. In this case, we've got a little clever sort of interactive mode where you can show the diff it wants to apply. So it, we're, we're fixing the unused import there in the Python code. Here we see a TypeScript file. It says we can remove this type annotation. We say, sure, go ahead and do that. It applies that change. Here's CSS. This is the style lint linter. Uh, and so again, it suggests making a change. Uh, this is a trivial one. So now if we run it again, uh, sorry, uh, we'll, we'll look at the diff and we see that ha just by having run lint, we've applied the fixes. Um, Right, so that's pretty simple. Uh, of course, you would want to wire this up on CI as well. Um, that's not in scope here. Um, so I did manage to finish with a few minutes left for questions. Next, next steps, I'm, I'm hoping that all of you are convinced that you don't want to recreate this for yourselves and that it's nice to just have one way to do this across all languages. So please, please, give, please install it and uh, come help out. We've had a lot of contributions to add more tools uh, and sort of the goal here is to have all languages and all linters uh, in one spot. So thank you very much. I'll take some questions. Uh, so first of all, thanks. Um, then last year's BasicCon, there was a talk, if I remember correctly, about validation actions. I haven't tried them out myself yet, to be honest. But if I remember correctly, they were advertised as the better way of running a linter instead of aspects. So I just wondered why you went for aspects. Yes, I think, uh, like I said, there's a few ways you can hold the linting. And if you want it to be a build failure, I think validation actions are equivalent in every way I can think of to running aspects over the graph. No, no, that's not true. I'm sorry. Validation actions have a downside, which is that you need to modify the rule set to include the validation action. You can't sort of take a rule that somebody else wrote and then stick a validation action on it. Yeah. So actually, yeah, the reason to do aspects is you don't have to change the rule set. If you're a rule set author and you want to provide build failure as the way to do lint, then you would probably add validation actions as a first class thing in your rule set. Yeah. Okay. Uh, over there? Yeah, if your repo has multiple different lints for the same language, would your lint sh have to have, I have two questions, like multiple uh, target patterns to apply the different factories? Like, uh, um, yeah, for whatever, like two Java things and they have two different Java lints. And then secondly, I know you can make aspects in the build file themselves versus you know, hyphen hyphen aspect. Is there a difference there in why you chose one versus the other? Okay, let me try to do them in order. So first of all, what if I have multiple linters uh, for one language, or I want to configure them differently, perhaps? They're configured, yeah, basically yeah. configured differently. So, so um, for the most part, this rule set assumes that all linters kind of behave the same, and so wrapping them kind of just works. 
Uh, and for the most part, as far as multiple configurations, this is true because most linters will use the configuration file that's in the nearest common ancestor folder of the thing that they're currently linting. So for most of these, you'll see in the examples, I just pass all of the config files that are in the repo to the definition of the aspect. And then as it's running actions over the graph, it will naturally select the configuration that makes sense for that location. I know that in some cases this doesn't work. Like for check style, I think there's an open uh, issue to like, you'll have to tell it which segments of the code you want it to use which configurations for. Um, of course, you can, without loss of generality, you can, have, you can declare multiple aspects in that linters.bzl file. Um, now the challenge is it's up to you in that lint.sh to say, I want to run this one on this code and this other one on this other code. So you know, this is a way of declaring those aspects, but it's not that opinionated about what the developer experience should be for invoking them. Yeah, the second question was also aspects in the build as a target versus hyphen hyphen aspect. Yes. Okay. So I don't know about in the build file, but when you declare when you when you declare a rule, you can declare sorry the, rule that def, yeah in a that, rule that, definition that depends on the aspect or I yes in a rule definition you can say I want to to invoke the following aspect over this attribute or you know uh, transitively by using add or underscore aspects to walk some graph um, that works fine, but again you have to be in control of the rule to add that there, and so that breaks my my assumption that I'm not going to modify the rule set. I'm not the rule set author here. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, um, just a quick question. Um, does rules link support like MyPy and PyWrite? Excellent I question. I started doing that at one point, and uh, I closed the PR and instead added a bit of documentation explaining why it does not have MyPy and PyWrite. The reasoning is, it's not. It's it's a gray area. Um, you know, if you, in some languages, type checking is built into being able to run the program at all. And nobody talks about how do I transpile my Java code without type checking it. Um, and in other languages like Python, you can think of it as a linter or you could think of it as don't run your code until the types are correct. Um, I think the, my reasoning was that in, in, in rules Python, let's say, or whatever the, the, the canonical rule set is for that language, those, that's the most likely place to add type checking as a first class thing. For TypeScript, for example, type checking is very tied in with the compiler, so rules TS provides type checking. Um, that's the current state. Uh, I think it also just so happens that there's already a, a rules MyPy from Theorem LP. There's a, there's a Bazel MyPy integration that's in the Bazel contrib GitHub org. We're actually gonna start working on some PyWrite rules soon. I think those are just gonna be standalone. So I, I don't have a super great explanation for why it's not, but that's what I came up with. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 